Well, now, if you have not been changed through the music, through the worship, through the presence of God in this building today, I believe you're about to be changed through the word. Somebody shout through the word. First Sunday, the Lord blessed my son, Pastor Rich, and myself to sit on this stage and talk about uh, when they go low, we go high. And then on last week, we enjoyed a powerful message coming from Pastor Kearney, speaking about when they go low, we go high. And today, that we're going to hear from two of my favorite people in the whole world. Amen. My wife of 50 years and my daughter, amen, uh, my attorney, uh, my legal counsel, none other than Pastor Karen Dykes. So I want you to put your hand together, open your hearts and your minds, and hear what thus saith the Lord. Somebody shout change. I believe a change is about to happen. Amen. You all take it over, ladies, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Change. Glory to God. Has come over me. This one's turning red. I think it's gonna gonna go out. But for one moment, I just want to just say that sometimes we, we see these choir members up here and we don't know what they're going through in their life. And they sing for y'all like everything's okay. But can I tell you that that some of us are singing through pain, we're singing through hurt, we're singing through struggle. And so I wonder if there's anybody out there that's going through any pain, hurt, or struggle in the room today. I dare you just to stand up on your feet and just give God an anyhow praise. I'm going to praise him in the midst of the storm. I'm going to praise him in the midst of the rain. I'm going to praise him in the heartache. I'm going to praise him through the pain because I know that what's to come is better than what's been. I know that God's future for me is bright and I know that all things are working together for the good. Oh, come on, I dare you. Come on, give him some. Just give him 60 more seconds of, Lord, I love you. Lord, I thank you. If it wasn't for God on my side, I don't know where I would be. I don't know who I would be. I don't know. I don't know. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Hey, God. God, I thank you. Do you know that, that, that there's a, a high school student that plays with one of our youth? That, that they play on the football team, that he didn't make it to this morning. They were in a car accident last night with a drunk driver, but we are here today. We have breath in our body. We have ability in our limbs. If you can praise him, I dare you just to take a moment. Say, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Hey, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While you're standing. I want us to go before the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. Eternal God, the most high God. Hallelujah. God of might and miracle, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, we need you to heal. Heal the Franklin football team. Heal those that have lost the running back. Heal, God, their brokenness. For surely you have borne their griefs and carried their sorrows. I pray, God, for the parents, that you would give them peace that passes understanding. I pray, God, that it would cause us to measure our days and apply our hearts to wisdom. Father, send your word this morning. Heal us. Set us free. Change us. Bless your people. Make us to be lights in darkness. Make us more like you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let those that agree say amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And I'm just so honored and humbled to be here this morning in this space. It took a miracle to hang the stars into space and the moon in its place. But when God saved my soul, he cleansed and made me whole. It took a miracle of love and grace. I just want to thank all of you for the birthday love. I want to thank my God for allowing me to see 69 years on this earth. I'm just grateful because many didn't make it. 
I also want to give honor to our pastor, our bishop, the man of God. And I'm here because he's here. I'm here because he heard the voice of God as a young teenager, and he obeyed the voice of God. And even like Abraham, he left his kindred. When God said, leave New Jersey, the garden state where cherry blossoms are in the park, and come to El Paso, and he said, God said, we got to go. <laughs> and I said, well, can't we just wait till the baby's born? That would have been baby rich. Look at big old <laughs> baby rich over there with the gray beard, gray hair, looking like Moses. But he was the baby, unborn child. Go ahead. And so I think that he, the, the baby lamented that he didn't get to be born in New Jersey, but he's here. He's here. And uh, that was the second man in my life who brought me to El Paso saying God said. The first man was my father in 1956, and he says in 1949, the year that I was born, God said, El Paso needs you. And who would know that? We are here today because of the legacy of my parents. And uh, I'm just grateful to God because my greatest desire is for my life to give God glory. And that was my desire even as a single young girl when we were looking at the guys and wondering which guy was looking at us. And Guess who's uh, looking at me and I keep looking at him. I remember <laughs> praying at the altar in the house of God. I remember that day vividly. Uh, that I said, God, I want to marry whoever will bring you the greatest glory. And so in the multitude of counselors, there's truly safety. I spoke to my dad and my dad. I said, Daddy, which one of these? <laughs> you know, because she was a player back then, you know. <laughs> which one of these ninjas, Lord, do you? And my daddy, you say, he said that one right there. So. <laughs> He was, he was really the star catch. He was a minister. He would play the piano. And, you know, these musicians, you know, the enemy sets his target at the musicians. And they really have to be strong because it seemed like all the girls want to get a musician. <laughs> all the single ladies. <laughs> I feel like but I'm just a hype man. thank God that <laughs> he has blessed us with uh, amazing musicians, beginning with Bishop. Uh, one man told Bishop, you're the first organ player that I've known that wasn't gay. Somebody told my husband that. Do um, you understand what I'm saying? And I don't think Destiny has had any gay organ players in our history, in our 30 years. First lady, let's just go to the script. It's time. <laughs> when they go low, we go high. She's reminiscing because she had her birthday. Y'all put your hands together for 69 years. We got a message we supposed to bring. <laughs> I'm serious. You get you got a lot that we prepare. We gotta talk about. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> oh my God! You know, listen. She who would think she's an attorney? I think even in middle school, she was a class clown. Could you imagine that? And that's a whole another story. But Bishop has assigned us to speak on this amazing topic, when they go low, we go high. And some of you might know he borrowed it from a speech from Michelle Obama. And uh, I think she's a woman of grace. And I thank God for uh, the character and integrity that we've witnessed in her. I thank God for Pastor Rich and Bishop ministering on the first topic. And I just enjoyed it so much. So glad to have Pastor Rich here from L.A. I do believe God has just ordained this time, even though I have really felt for him because of the pain of a broken leg that he suffered because the Uber driver just kept going before he got in the car. Uh, and I know it's been, but, but God is going to repay him because you know your present suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that God's going to be revealed. So whatever you're suffering, whatever you're going through, you got to hold on. Don't commit suicide. Because you have to have a mountain that's high as that valley. So just know that all the suffering do is doing is strengthening you. Because when you get in a high place, there's a lot of rocks that get thrown at you. And you have to have the strength 
not to fight back. So endure whatever you're going through, knowing that the refiner's fire is our desire to be cleansed and purified that God would be glorified. How many know that gold is only refined in fire? So you're not going to be destroyed unless you're wood, hay, or stubble. But gold is going to be refined. So we read the scripture, Isaiah 55 and 9, and see that God has set the bar for believers very high. He has set a very high bar. Isaiah 55 and 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I think that Pastor Perry hit it out the park last week when he compared the word of God to an M16, you know, because the scripture does say the word of God is powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, and piercing between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And the word of God is something that we need to be skillful in, just as that young soldier had to be skillful in the M16. But in our subject today, I want to define when they go low, who they may be, and we go high, who we are. Now, I just want to ask, is there anybody here that loves Jesus? I want to know if you love my Jesus. Well, the Bible says, if any man will come after me, he's got to deny himself and take up his cross and follow him. Now, love is going to be something that we're going to talk about a lot today, and I love the topic of love. I love hearts. I, you know, I, I, I thank God for the commitment uh, to love, and because my mom made me love everybody, and that's why I think God has blessed us with such diversity at Destiny. It's so good to see people of every ethnicity. You all may not know that this is not the norm across America. There are a few churches that have different ethnicities worshiping together, but that's not the norm. Usually, the hour of prayer is the most segregated hour in America. Did you know that? But because my mother taught me to love everybody, it, I, I think everybody's attracted to love. People know, they, they may not speak your language, but they understand when you love them. Amen? So I thank God for um, that training that my mother gave me. And if we are the, we that goes high, we have to be the people willing to deny ourselves and imitate Christ. The we that goes high must believe that God is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You are not going to go high unless you know there's a reward in it. You're not going to do anything unless you know that there's a benefit, not, not if you're in your right mind, that is. Now, we must believe that God has planned an amazing life of victory, a life of fulfillment, a life of purpose, a life of joy, a life of prosperity. Jesus says, I came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. You got to believe that if you're going to take his ways, if you're going to make his ways your ways, and if you know that he is wiser than us and he knows the end from the beginning, God wants us not only to have a wonderful life now in the present life, but in the world to come, he wants you to have eternal life. In a place where there's no tears, there's no dying, there's no crying, no more taxes, no more bills, no more pain. I'm looking for a place, a city not made with hands. And that is what I want all of you to experience because it's not God's will that any should perish. But everyone should come to the truth. And Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. So when you get Jesus, you got it all. We've got to follow the example of Moses who refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the children of Israel than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, just think about Meghan Markle. She has entered into a royal life. Imagine her denying that life because, you know, all of the fame and glitz and glamour that goes with royalty, we can't even hardly imagine. 
but to choose to suffer over that type of life because he esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all of Egypt. Now, how many know there was some wealth in Egypt? But we that go high are the people who set our hope in God. Our hope is not built on the things that we see because everything we see is temporary. If there ever was a time we would know that it would be today when we look at the cities in California and Malibu and what a city of paradise utterly destroyed. And these were not cardboard houses like we look across the border. These were mansions, multi-million dollar mansions burnt like matchsticks. And then we see the senseless killing that's happening when some deranged person is full of the evil one and goes in and shoots up young folks by the dozens. And we know that life is short. And even if we live to be 99, life is short when you compare it to eternity. So we are the people who have set our hope on God so that our hope is anchored in Christ on a rock that when the storm comes, when the wind blows, we're still able to stand. See, some folks, when the stock market goes down as it is right, right now, they, they think their value is gone. But when you understand that your hope is in God, the treasure's in you. So those things that you lost, you can get them again because they weren't the treasure. And do you know what? God doesn't just give you back what you lost. He gives you better. You get double for your trouble. That's what I see in the word of God. So when we are the ones who go high, when they go low, we recognize that the battle is not ours. The battle belongs to the Lord. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. And when we look and see the enemy on every hand, understand that you are no match for the devil. And if you're fighting a person, you, you go too low. You know, you're fighting principalities in the heavenlies. And the only match, the only equal is the spirit of the living God. So God wants you to be full of the spirit. We who go higher know that we are the sons of God. And I want you to look in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1 through 5 because John writes so much about what it means and how we become a son of God. In St. John 1 and 12, he says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them who believe on his name. So how do I become a son of God? Just by believing on his name. So then not only in St. John, but I told you we're going to look at 1 John. And in 1 John, I have uh, two versions of scripture. Uh, one of my favorite things happens to be Bibles. So I have a lot of them. got two Bibles under it. Oh. Bishop just preaches with one Bible. First lady got two. <laughs> and then not only do I have two Bibles, I have like every version of the Bible that you almost could imagine. I mean, God, we are living in an incredible age of technology. There is no excuse that you don't read your word. I mean, you can have it in uh, every, whatever version help you, helps you to understand the message, the NIV, the English Standard Version, all of them. You can have it in the palm of your hand. Isn't that incredible? Now, I told you we were going to read 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, and verse 11. It says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So how are we born of God? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your whole house shall be saved. Somebody say, too easy. See, the way is so simple that a fool does not even need to err. All who believe receive, as many as received him. How many of you have received Christ today? Well, I want you to know if you have not, you do not have to leave here without being born again. Because the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit. They are foolishness unto him. Because there are some things that are only spiritually reserved, discerned. Some things are hidden from the wise and the prudent, but revealed by the spirit of the living God. 
So whosoever believeth that Jesus is Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. We're talking about the father was the one that begat the son. Jesus was not begotten of a man, but he was begotten by the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit overshadowed the womb of the Virgin Mary, and the scripture prophesied, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, look what happens to people that are born again. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. That's how we can go high. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. I want to skip down to verse 11 that says, And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Somebody say, I am complete in Jesus. I lack nothing. There are two distinguishing factors between those who go low and we that go high. And number one is your decision. You get to choose whether you will believe and receive or whether you will doubt and do without. And the second is discipline, self-control. You've got to have the resolve and the ability to do the thing that you decide to do. We have to put on the mind of Christ our minds have to be transformed in order for us to ascend to the height of God's ways and go high. It takes just as much discipline in your spirit for your spirit man as it does for the flesh. Now, about three years ago, I made a decision that I knew I should have done many, many years before, uh, and I was influenced by some very precious friends who asked me to go to the gym with them that was opening on the grand opening day in October three years ago. And I went, and I never stopped going. And I learned that at the gym, the workout helps delay the decay. Now, everybody knows that we need, every doctor, every medical professional tells you, you need a workout regimen, but don't raise your hand. How many of you have a workout regimen? How many of you are actually doing what you know you need to do to take care of your temple? Now, what I find out that going to the gym, the maneuvers, the exercise are very simple. But what gets hard is the repetition, the repetition. You know, this is about a three-pound weight. How many of you know three pounds is not hard to lift? But what if you lift it about 15 times? You know, you gain some strength. You gain some endurance. Well, this is true when it comes to the spirit man. We need to learn how to exercise our senses to discern good from evil. Hold on. I'm going to cut in right there because first lady was the type of person who, before she started going to the gym, she would be like, I'm getting my workout right here doing these dishes, right? Like, I'm working out, folding these clothes. This is a workout right here. But then when you started to actually go to the gym, you saw that there was a difference between the dishes and the five-pound weights, right? You know what it makes me think? It thinks that folks that are not going to church and they staying home and they're thinking that this is my spiritual exercise. And they don't exactly. know that there's a big difference that when I actually get into the house of God, and I actually lift my hands in the sanctuary, and I actually bless him out of Zion, that there's a whole nother level Absolutely. that I'm going to go to, Some my people, spirit man. They think, oh, I could just listen to gospel on Sunday. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, I, oh, on Sundays, I listen to gospel in the morning, and then about, about noontime, I can switch it up. Or, oh, you know... On Mother's Day, I come because I go with my mama or on Easter. But there's a whole different regimen that you're going to talk about. Talk about that. Well, I, I first of all, want to confess that my body never wants to go. Okay? I just want you to understand. And I normally wake up without an alarm clock at 5.30 a.m. My gym appointment is at 6 a.m. 
But there are so many days that that bed wants to hug me and I don't want to get up. But I do it anyway. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if I don't do it, I won't get the results that I want to have. So I have the discipline to do it. Now, Hebrews 12, 11 tells us for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So as we pick up the word of God, I want to share three exercises very quickly spiritual exercises that we must commit to if we want to be spiritually fit just as we have to commit to diet and exercise if we want to be physically fit amen now the first thing is you got to become faithful to the house of God you see the scripture tells us those that are planted in the house of God shall flourish in the courts of our God how many know a plant in a pot doesn't do as well as one that's planted in or kept. The roots can't go as deep as those that are planted in the soil. Planted. So we got to be planted. And you know, David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. This David, who is a man after God's own heart, he also said in Psalm 27 and 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So then we read even in Hebrews that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is. Now, how many of us know some that are forsaking to assemble themselves in the house of God? There are people that just don't go to church anymore. There used to be a day that that was the norm. I thank my parents for bringing me to the house of God. And that is why I am here today. And I believe if I were to take a poll of you that many of you are here because you had parents that brought you to the house of God. What a tremendous legacy that they have given you because I wanted to take my children from dependence on me to dependence on God. I have buried both my mother and my father, but how many know I'm still in the house of God? Because when you train up a child in the way they should go, when they're old, they're not going to depart from it. The second thing, you got to set a daily time of devotion. Give me this day my daily bread. Now, we all know when you go to the grocery store or you go to the refrigerator, you don't just look at the food. You got to get some of it. You got to digest some of it if it's going to do you any good. Well, I strongly recommend that everyone have a great devotional. And this is one of my favorite, From Faith to Faith by Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. And I've been reading this for years now. And even though it's the same scriptures, the same devotional, week after week, it's just like that same chicken that you keep eating. You know, the same hot bread and salad you've been eating. (laughs) It's working, right? And if we stop doing it, it's not going to work. So you need to have a daily time of devotion. And the third thing is you got to practice obeying the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible says we are perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. You know, as I grew in Christ, you go from faith to faith and victory to victory. Jesus grew in stature and wisdom and favor with God and man. It took spiritual nourishment, the sincere milk of the word to grow. And at the end of every day, the Holy Spirit would speak to me. You didn't do that quite with the kindness that I wanted you to do that. And each time when I'm laying on the bed and I'm thinking about the things that happened that day and how they transpired and how it could have been better. And so every day I would try to get better. So how many know every morning you get a brand new mercy? So on the next morning when I get up, I have a brand new slate so I don't have the weight of condemnation and guilt on me. Because Jesus took our sins to Calvary. So I thank God for the great love wherewith he loved us. That while we were yet in sin, we were yet messed up. That he loved us so much. That he gave his life. He cleansed you with his own blood. What more could he do? My first lady said we were going to have a conversation and now I have ten minutes left. 
took five of my minutes. Every here's, 15. here's what's here's what's funny. Bishop asked me to speak. And when him and Rich got together, I was like, well, mom, you should do it with me. And she done took all the time. I can't even say. <laughs> you, you've got the rest <laughs> of the time. I have 10 minutes. You can no, have but 15. here's the deal. No, here's the deal. I, like, honestly, the, the thing that I was thinking about, and you'll see the contrast. It's funny because I feel like I'm so much like my mother in some contexts. And then there's other ways that I'm so much like my, my daddy, right? And so um, I guess you're going to see, see, see what it's like. How many of y'all have heard of the comedian Cat Williams? Anybody heard of Cat Williams? All right. It, who thinks he's funny? You think he's funny? I think he's funny. Okay, so uh, I was watching one of his specials, and uh, I'm not trying to say I recommend it in the house of God. Uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of curse words and things like that. But nonetheless, if you can get past the filth, um, he was talking about how one day he was smoking weed with Snoop Dogg. Now, I know, I know this don't seem spiritual, but just follow with me real quick. So he said he was smoking weed with Snoop Dogg. Now, Cat Williams said he was used to smoking weed, and so he was like, oh, this is nothing. I'm just going to smoke the same weed, but I'm just going to smoke it with Snoop. This is going to be wonderful, right? That's my version of Cat Williams. I just put that out there. Okay, so, so he says that he gets in this situation where he's the type of weed that, that Snoop is smoking is a whole nother type of weed. And, and so he asked the question, how high are you trying to get Snoop? How high are you trying to get? Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and say, how high are you trying to get? No, we're not talking about weed. We're not talking about weed. But when we're talking about when they go low, we go high. The question is, what are we measuring this height that we're trying to ascend to? What is the benchmark that we measure? Because let me just tell you this. Where I come from um, in the Pentecostal church background, it, being deep and spiritual was about, like, how long you spoke in tongues, right? Like, if you say, mama say, mama saw, mama kusa, long enough, then that means that, that you ha are high, right? Or, or if you pray, you pray like, oh, I pray three hours a day. I pray three hours. And you're like, do you even have a job? How do you pray? How do you pray for three hours a day? I don't understand it. You're supposed to be at work and, and stuff. So, and then, like, honestly, okay, this just gave me a flashback. There was one mother in the church that she got married a little later. She had, you know, a previous marriage. But she, she was seen as so spiritual that when people went to her brides, what do they call it? When it's, it's like the party right before you get married, the, the bridal shower, they were giving her, like, flannel gowns. It was like... Since all you're going to be doing is praying, all you just need this flannel gown when you go get married. But that's the thought. It's like all you're supposed to do is just, just stay in the holy place, stay in the heavenlies of heavenlies. And the Old Testament is a whole nother covenant from the New Testament. And so what happens is we start to mix the old. The old was all about have you been circumcised. The old was all about are you sacrificing the right thing. And it was all about this vertical relationship right here. But yet the old covenant, it was okay to hate your enemy. In the old covenant, it was okay to divorce your wife. In the old cup, you see what I'm saying? So there was all these things that as long as they were doing their spiritual things, you know, coming through and I'm going to get this lamb and I'm going to, you know, give this sheep and I'm going to do whatever, I can treat my neighbor any old kind of way. But the new covenant is a simpler covenant, but it's a more demanding covenant. And so when we are the ones that are calling ourselves believers, we're supposed to follow after the example of Christ. And so what I'm about, to, I'm about to read some scriptures before I tell you what I tell you, because what I have to tell you is kind of radical when you think about it, okay? Because we think about the fact that we, you know, do all these things that are spiritual, and that means that we're high. But I'm going to give you my point, and then we're going to go to the scriptures just in case you think I'm lying to you, okay? So here's my point. If you're taking notes, I'm going to give you three things to write down. The benchmark for measuring our spirituality is not how many scriptures we memorize or how many hours we pray. It is how we love others in comparison to how Jesus loved us. I'm, That'll preach. Can, 
Guys, just, I'm going to say it one more time, that the benchmark for measuring our spirituality is not how many scriptures we memorize or how many hours we pray. It is how we love others in comparison to how Jesus loved us. This is the new covenant. I don't do right just because, oh, the scripture tells me I have to do right. I do right because he loved me. And if he loved me the way that he loved me, the least that I could do is extend myself to love somebody else. If he died for me when I was in my filth, the least I could do is give myself for somebody else. You see what I'm saying? And we like, like we want to be churchy and be like on the surface, oh, yeah, I love you. Oh, I love you. I love you, but then you're talking about them behind their back. You know they have a need, and you know you have what they need, but you're not giving it to them. Oh, but I love you. Oh, praise Jesus. Hallelujah. No, no, this is not how Jesus said to love. So we're going to go to the scripture real quick. In John 15. John was one of Jesus' disciples. He was one that really received a revelation of the love that God had for him. And he quoted Jesus as saying this, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Here's, here's, here's what's unbelievable. He told them this before he died on the cross. He was giving them a, really just a foreshadowing of what it is to come. So back in the Old Testament, not only did they have the Ten Commandments, right, which Christians are trying to put up in courthouses and all this kind of stuff because we think the Ten Commandments is magic. But do you know, ever notice that Jewish people aren't ever trying to put the Ten Commandments up anywhere? They're never trying to die. Oh, I have a crusade for the Ten Commandments because it was more than just Ten Commandments. It was actually 613 commandments that you had to obey and you had to do every single one right in order to try to be righteous. But how many of y'all know that the commandments in and of themselves never saved anybody? So what would happen is all the commandments would do was show me where I was falling short. And so then Jesus came to remedy what a commandment could not remedy. But even in his sacrifice, he said, don't worry about the 613. I'm giving you a new commandment. And this new commandment, it's simpler. It's easy. Everybody can understand it, but it's more demanding. Because it's not enough just to go to the temple and sacrifice. This is something you got to live out day by day by day. Okay? So he said, this is my commandment. They didn't need a new one, but he's giving it to them. He's changing the game. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. So a lot of us are trying to be like, well, I don't commit adultery. I don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't hang with those that do. But you also don't love. And the, and the only commandment, the, the one thing that he said that he wants us to do is to love. Now, here's what's crazy. He didn't just tell us to love like, you know, some, some low level of love. He said, I want you to in the same way that I love you, I want you to love them. Now, that's a crazy kind of love. That's a come down 42 generations and lay down your life kind of love. That's a go down into the depths of hell and suffer for three days in death and rise again kind of love. And when I, I started to hear, it's a resurrection type of love. And when I started to, to hear this, this revelation of the fact that what God is requiring of us when it comes to how high we're trying to go, all I, I literally, I felt bad. Bad because I could reflect on my life and reflect on relationships and reflect on people who I failed to love in this kind of way. Because, you know, we want to have a love that's like, oh, I love you, a feeling, and we don't do anything about it. Like, I love you, but I'm not talking to you no more because I'm sick of you because you already done. You, am I the only one who's been there? You see what I'm saying? But, but when I start to see that this is what Christ is, is calling us to, it's a whole nother level of high. So how high are we trying to get? We're trying to get to the point where we reflect the love that Jesus gave to us on the cross. How high Change are we trying me, to oh get? So then, so then th look this. I'm going to read this one scripture. I'm a, I'm a, we're going to go real quick. This is 1 John 
4, 19 through 21. And in 1 John, he's not just quoting Jesus, but now he's giving his interpretation to the church. And it, it says this, I'm reading in the NLT, we love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a lie. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And if he has given us this one command, those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Now, how many of y'all know people that go from church to church, they skip in one place or another because they can't love the people that go to the church? Oh, my feelings are hurt. Oh, they didn't let me lead the song. Oh, uh, I didn't get to preach my sermon. Okay, whatever it is, we're, we're not supposed to be doing this because we're supposed to be rooted and grounded in love. If, if I can't love the person that's in the church, then what makes me so different? What makes me different than anybody in the world? So when we ask the question, how high am I trying to get? We're trying to get to the level of height where we reflect the love of Jesus, okay? So here's my, here's my second point, okay? To love like Jesus, we cannot conform to the world but must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. First Lady already talked about how we have to get in the word, how we have to come to church regularly, how we have to do these things because at the end of the day, we need to change who we are in here from who the world created and who the culture created to being a reflection of the truth of who God is. And, and that takes time and that takes discipline. And we have to be aware of what we're thinking because what we're thinking affects what we're feeling and what we're choosing. And some of us, we're, we're continuously making a particular choice that we know is not good for us, but the reason why we can't break the cycle is because we haven't broken the thought pattern that keeps going in the same direction. So in order to love like Jesus, we're going to have to change our mind, all right? So I'm going to read this one scripture and then one more point, and then we're going to go, okay? This is Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 43 through 48, and it's kind of cold-blooded, okay, because he says this. Matthew said, quoting Jesus, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's Old Testament. How many of y'all would like that? Like, okay, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Go get them. Go get them. You can't handle me, right? We want to be right there. But he said, that's the old, that's the old law. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as children of your Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So it's not even just enough to love those that we call brothers and sisters in Christ. If we want to get as high as what Jesus is calling us to, we need to even be able to love our haters. And, 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 and this is going to take, like I said, a renewing of your mind. Can I tell you this? This is just, this might be revelation to you. I don't know. But most of the people that you think are hating on you aren't even thinking about you. That, that the people that you feel like hurt your feelings and did you wrong, they're just trying to survive. They're just trying to do the best they can for where they are. And so we're over here judging them like, she ain't even think about me. She ain't even see me. She ain't even do. And the truth is, is no, she didn't think about you. You don't know the hurt that she was going through. You don't know the grief that she was trying to overcome. You don't know the childhood that she came out of. You don't know what she's struggling with. So you're judging on the outside when in reality, the Bible says that even though we walk in the flesh, even though we walk in this physical, we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to God through the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What this thing is about, it's about you changing the way that you think. Because when I seek, you can't see your real enemy. 
So if I can see you and I think you're my enemy, the truth is, is we're both fighting an enemy that we cannot see. And I should be able to love you because the same enemy that's trying to kill me is trying to kill you. The same enemy that's trying to destroy me is trying to destroy you. The same enemy that wants to steal from me is trying to steal from you. And so I need to renew my mind to understand it's not us versus them. We are in this thing together. We are in this thing together, and in order for us to be who God is calling us to be, we have to go the height of the love of Jesus. This is my last point, and we're going to go. My last point is this. If you want to live going high, even when others go low, then you have to ask yourself this critical question. Everything you face, every situation you're in, even when you're lying in your bed at night, you need to ask this question. What does Christ love for me, compel from me. What does Christ's love for me compel from me? Because if he said that I'm supposed to love others the way he loved me, then what I receive from him, I've got to give to others. And, and what we'll find when we start to ask these questions is God has put inside of us the solutions to some of the greatest problems in our world. If you ask the question, what does Christ's love for me compel from me, you might find that God is telling you that you need to adopt a child. And you'll be the, the, the person that rescues and transforms somebody's life. If you ask, what does Christ's love for me compel from me, you might be the one that visits the sick person in the hospital even when you don't know them because you know what it is to be alone. If you ask yourself, what does God's love for me, Christ's love for me compel from me, you might find yourself going to school and studying to find the solution to cancer. I don't know what it is, but God is placed inside of each and every one of us gifts and callings and things and they're not just for us to be self-aggrandized they're for us to demonstrate the love that Christ has for the world you are the solution to somebody's problem you are the answer to somebody's prayer it's not enough for us to just try to get all that we can get for ourselves it's time for us to figure out how can I give the way Jesus gave to me so come on, I invite you all just to stand on your feet for a second. If, if you're one in here that feels like, hey, at the end of the day, if I check myself, I know that I haven't loved the way Jesus loved me. He loved me unconditionally, and I put conditions on it. He loved me when I did not apologize, and I'm here waiting for them to apologize before I forgive them. He loved me. You get what I'm saying? If, you, if that's you in this room, I dare you just to wave your hands in this room to say, hey, I recognize I can go higher. I can go higher. I can go higher. I know this is me. I can raise both hands and my feet. I can go higher. So come on. Right now, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you bless everybody in this room. God, that you see that we've been trying to live by the Old Testament. We've been trying to get them back. We've been trying to, if they did me wrong, I get to do them wrong. We've been doing all this stuff that feels good to our flesh, but it's tearing our households apart. It's tearing our families apart. It's help, hurting us on our job. It's hurting us in every aspect of our life. And people aren't seeing Jesus in us. And so, Father, I pray right now that there's somebody in this room that needs the courage because they didn't know that you were all about love because of what they saw wasn't love from Christians, that now they know this is what Jesus is all about, and they want to choose you. So, Father, I pray, Father, for all the people in this room, if there's somebody in here that needs to choose Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they have the courage to do that now because it's the best decision that they could ever make. And even though that Christian did not reflect Christ, Jesus loves you. He died for you. He cares about you. He says you're worth dying for. If that's you in this room and you do not know Jesus, I, I want to invite you just to raise your hand in the air. We're going to pray a prayer all together. If you don't know Jesus and you need to know him, put your hands up. We're going to pray for you. If you don't know Jesus and you need to know him. All right, awesome. It looks like most of us know him, but we need to know him better. So this is what we're going to do. How many of y'all want to touch and agree that God is going to take us to another level of love, another level of, of excellence, another level of just being, being a reflection of what he's done for us? Bishop, I'm going to start this prayer. I'm going to ask you to come finish it, all right, Bishop? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we repent. 
We are sorry because we have dropped the ball on carrying your love to this world. God, we have allowed people to be hungry in our neighborhood and we didn't feed them. We have allowed people in our job to be discouraged and we didn't take time to listen. We did not lay ourselves down because we thought it was too inconvenient and we just wanted to go about our life. But God, I pray right now that you stir up inside of us a supernatural, Christ-driven love like never before. God, I'm believing right now that you're stirring up gifts and callings. You're stirring up gifts and callings. You are stirring up the supernatural things inside of us so that when we go out into the world, we will be able to transform areas that we touch God we're going to transform our job transform a particular sector we're going to be able to transform our household because we're going to be a reflection of the love that you have for us we're going to do what it compels from us finish our bishop hallelujah, hallelujah. change us oh God hallelujah, make us hallelujah. more like you Lord God how can I duplicate the love you have shown for me to other people how can I be a conduit, Lord God, of that love? When people, some seem to be unlovable, Lord, you've told us in your word to continue to love. So how high do we want to go when others are going low? We want to go as high as possible in love. We want to love our enemies, those that despitefully use us, Lord God. Those that haven't done us properly as we think they ought to, we must still love them. We thank you, Lord God. For the word that has come forth from First Lady and, and Pastor Karen today, let, letting us realize that as others may go low, we must go high. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us shout amen. And amen again. Put your hand together.